This week on The Wheelhouse. Ooh, the horror. And the laughs. Hollywood and politics. For Connecticut Public, I'm Frankie Graziano. This is The Wheelhouse, a show that connects politics to the people. We got your weekly dose of politics in Connecticut and beyond right here. The Oscars are finally upon us. On Sunday, the stars will step onto that red carpet for a night of glitz, glam, And dare we say some politics? There's the politics of who was nominated and who's going to win. And the way we traditionally think of politics woven into the plot lines of many of this year's films. With me this morning, I have two guests who will be tuned into this weekend's events. Jeffrey Dudas, political science professor at the University of Connecticut. Thank you so much for joining us again on The Wheelhouse, Jeff. I'm happy to be here, Frankie. Happy to have you. Eric Deggins, TV critic and media analyst for NPR. Eric Excited to have you on the show, particularly on Oscars Week. Thank you so much for coming by. Yeah, thanks for having me. Just want to remind folks they could join in on that conversation, too. What do you want to ask us about this week's show, and what do you want to ask us about how it connects to politics? Maybe you want to talk about some other kind of event in history connecting politics to Hollywood. Give us a call, 888-720-9677. Eric, big year for historical thrillers. You had Killers of the Flower Moon, Oppenheimer, and Zone of Interest, all nominated for Best Picture. What can these movies, not necessarily taking a look, I guess, at uh, at what these movies have done stylistically or anything like that, but just the content and what it could do for an audience, these films that are showcasing the politics of the past? Well, you know, one of the things I always say about um, film and TV that depict historical events is that They are not so much about the time they are depicting. They are about the time in which they were created. So um, even though Oppenheimer, of course, is about the creation of the um, first nuclear weapon and what that would mean for the world and what that would mean for science and what that would mean for America, it's also very much uh, kind of a a meditation on, you know, what what do you do with the ultimate power? Um, how does it transform you? How does it transform society? Um, the the whole great man theory, you know, um, how do great men shape the world? And we have a lot of great men that we're contending with uh, in our own space right now, trying to figure out how they're shaping the world. <clears throat> so there's um, so there's a you know even though Oppenheimer depicts a time you know long past. A lot of the questions that it asks are very contemporary. And, you know, same with the zone of interest, you know, um, uh, even though it's set, um, you know, you're watching this family um, of, of someone who runs a concentration camp and he lives right right next to it. Um, it's also about uh, the banality of evil. It's also about being adjacent to atrocity, um, how some things can seem very normal, even though they're next to horrific things, how, um, you know, some systems prop up people unfairly so that they get to live lives of luxury and power and largesse while um, exploiting uh, people who don't deserve it. You know, all of that kind of stuff is very relevant to today. And that's why these films are so powerful. They're not really talking about things that happened back then. They're talking about issues that we're grappling with today, but they're using history as a way to get us to see it in a different kind of way. And that's why I find these films so uh, compelling. It's so uncomfortable, too, particularly Zone of Interest. And I think you're I think it's designed to be that way because, you know, as a, as a student of history and a student of World War II and the Holocaust, just the, the comfort. You talked about the banality of evil there. That's such a, a great way to phrase it. Just the comfort that... Uh, that the, the family and, and uh, the people living just uh, adjacent to the camp are, are feeling. And it's just made to make you feel uncomfortable. And you wonder about the comfort that people have now and sort of that banality of evil kind of concept that you bring up there. Jeffrey, I want to get into the history of Hollywood and these types of award shows. Give me this intersection of politics and the movies coming out of Hollywood. Has this always existed? Is this not just a today thing? 
Right. It's not just a today thing. In fact, the the way in which we tell our stories to one another are uh, deeply evocative of the collective dreams and nightmares that a community holds at any one time. And when I think about the, the intersection between politics and popular culture, uh, I always go back, or politics and Hollywood in this case, um, I'm always brought back to um, a line from the essayist Joan Didion uh, when she wrote that we tell ourselves stories in order to live. And what she meant by that was that a great deal of the human experience and a great deal of the ways in which communities try to figure out how to live with one another, um, a great deal of that consists in our trying to make sense of our collective experiences together. And so the, the thing about these contemporary movies like Oppenheimer and Zone of Interest, Eric's exactly right, that these are stories that are working out present day contemporary kinds of concerns and using the lens of historical events, greater and lesser known historical events in order to explore them. And so when I think of Oppenheimer, on one hand, it's exactly right that what the surface text tells us is that this is a story about the designers and the builders of the first atomic bomb. On the other hand, it's also a story about how it is that a community might respond in periods of intense technological change and intense technological innovation, particularly when the inventors and the creators of those uh, technological changes are not in particularly attuned to the potential consequences of that, of those, um, of those innovations. All of this maps on very clearly to contemporary concerns about AI, about um, the notion that machines are being designed to have autonomous intelligence and autonomous emotionality, and that there's this kind of rush forward to creating and innovating in this space without a whole lot of concern about the potential consequences. So there, Oppenheimer is a way to allow audiences to kind of think through this issue of the potential both utopian and dystopian outcomes that might come from the sorts of technological upheaval that we find ourselves in now in a way that's historically analogous to the atomic bomb period. Definitely want to get into dystopia a little bit later because a lot of our shows are and movies now are reflecting this dystopia. But just the way that you talk, Jeff, uh, you're so passionate about what you talk about. It's so easy to, 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 to get back to when I was watching Oppenheimer and I have that image in my head as a person who's also an anxiety sufferer that uh, Oppenheimer must have felt like in that, uh, in, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about Cillian Murphy, obviously, but or Killian Murphy, but, you know, the, watching the two bombs go away on the, on the truck there. And, and now it's basically out of his hands what him and his team have created. I can't imagine uh, that the anxiety that would, one would feel there, but you're, you're talking about overall the power that people have and, and, particularly once it's away from them, how that could really impact people. Hey, I, they screened Birth of a Nation in the White House. Uh, yeah. I, I know that's one thing you talked to our producer about before here. Is that uh, one of the first moments that we saw this kind of Hollywood kind of vibe happening uh, on screen? And then also, if you can talk about this, 50 years later, after they do that, we actually have an actor in the White House. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So The Birth of a Nation is generally recognized as the first major Hollywood movie. Um, you wouldn't call it a blockbuster um, because just because that concept wasn't really around. But it's it's a technically innovative movie and it pioneers. It's So the, the movie is directed by D.W. Griffith and it pioneers a whole bunch of technological elements that would eventually come to seem commonplace in cinema. Um, things like the jump cut, um, things like the the sort of the fading in and out, um, the kind of watery effect visually that you would get coming over a character's face as they are thinking back uh, to a period in, in their history. Um, and the, the kind of um, the, the close ups on faces, all of this stuff that we so take for granted was technologically um, innovated by Griffith in The Birth of a Nation. The Birth of a Nation, on the other hand, is also a, an infamously racist uh, story that is focused upon the, 
the way in which white terrorism comes to um, to serve as the leading edge towards the end of the Reconstruction period at the end of the American Civil War. And so the way in which um, the white power structure in the South works in a coordinated fashion to eventually put the Jim Crow regime into place. And the movie is released in 1915. And it, as as you had suggested, Frankie, it finds a very uh, excited and welcome audience in then American President Woodrow Wilson, who was himself a originally a historian who had been one of the pioneer thinkers in this idea that the coming of Jim Crow in the South was a good thing and that it was a redemption of the the way in which the South had been badly treated uh, during the Reconstruction period after the end of the American Civil War. And so it was a, a topic that Wilson was very passionate about himself. He was convinced about the historical accuracy of this movie. And he pioneered the, the practice of screening Hollywood movies in the basement of the White House, first run Hollywood movies in the basement of the White House. And so so besotted was Wilson with the birth of a nation that he famously claimed that it was like writing history with lightning. And here again, he's referring to the kind of the, the innovative technical elements. Um, from then on, you get this very formal and clear relationship between American politics at the highest level, as seen in the White House, and a lot of the, the trends and the actual movies that are coming out of Hollywood, which culminate eventually, as you say, Frankie, in the 1980 election of, the, uh, of Ronald Reagan, who had come up in the 1930s and early 1940s in Hollywood as a, as a uh, contract actor. So you have Reagan in the White House there. There's that uh, kind of, I, I, I don't know if allegory is the word, between kind of uh, Hollywood and politics. Um, I, I just want to ask you really quickly before we move on to Eric, Jeff, one thing you've been talking about your class to your class is talking about, you know, gender politics and identity here and, and, and Barbie that recently came yeah. out such an important film that came out this year. And it's really, uh, obviously it's, uh, it's nominated for a lot of awards, but uh, it's, it's become a controversy at this point because I don't believe it was nominated for a best picture. No, I don't think so. It has a lot of nominations, but neither Greta Gerwig nor Margot Robbie um, were nominated in their respective categories. And I think that that's correct, that the movie was not nominated as the best picture either. Um, you know, Barbie as a, as, as a visual uh, extravaganza is quite astonishing, right? I mean, it's... Um, it is exactly the sort of movie that you would like to see in the theater, as we were talking about off air a little bit earlier. Mm -hmm. um, and to me, the most interesting thing about Barbie, though, is, is less the story that it tells and more the reactions that it has caused, um, both sort of glowingly positive on one hand and vitriolically negative on the other hand. And uh, it, it's exactly one of those things that Eric was talking about earlier in which the it's the use of a, a fictional space, a fictional story in order to explore contemporary concerns. And, you know, in, in a moment in which we've got, you know, as always, but maybe even more heightened than ordinarily so, we've got, you know, pretty extreme, um, you know, gender dynamics and pretty extreme concerns about gender autonomy, right? We're in the post Roe versus Wade era. Um, and, you know, we're in, in an era in which, you know, questions about reproductive autonomy um, are, are so deeply linked and so deeply, so deeply linked to overall issues of, of gender dynamics and are so present um, in, on the contemporary political agenda that a film like Barbie that is, you know, all about what it might mean for us to live in a community or a society that was, um, that was controlled by women rather than by men and the, the, the allegory um, that is portrayed in the contrasts between Bobby land and the real world. Um, the kinds of things that are going on there, it's, I guess it's not surprising that they would generate such intense reactions 
that don't really have a whole lot to do with the story itself, but are rather about more deeply felt concerns and anxieties that we are trying to work our way through collectively. I should note that um, Barbie obviously was nominated for Best Picture, but the, oh. the rub and the controversy here has been Greta Gerwig not getting her due for Best Director. Uh, I apologize for that. But we, we there's such a contrast now when we talk about a film like The Birth of a Nation compared to what we see uh, people in Hollywood and people in society try to do now, which is be more inclusive. You have a movie like Barbie nowadays here, and you have some of these other stories that we're talking about where we're uh, Killers of the Flower Moon, for example. We're talking about genocide of, of Native Americans. Uh, these, these things that, we can, that we're seeing on screen now that we wouldn't necessarily have seen 100 years ago. And I come to you, Eric, because I want to say, I want to talk about more takeaways from this year's nominees. It seems to be a, a diverse group of performers that are going to be honored on Sunday. It seems to be a diverse slate of films. Uh, what are your thoughts? Uh, well, uh, yeah, I was going to point out, yeah, that Barbie did get nominated for Best Picture. And the controversy was that um, neither Greta Gerwig nor Margot Robbie, there you go. the lead actress, uh, were nominated for Best Director or nominated for Best Actress. Uh, they each have been nominated for Oscars in other categories. Uh, because the show was, because the film was nominated for Best Picture, Margot Robbie is one of the producers, so she's technically nominated there. And Greta Gerwig was nominated for writing. Uh, she's also a producer, so she's nominated uh, among the be Best Picture people, but she's also nominated for writing this screenplay. So they were nominated for Oscars, but they weren't nominated for Oscars for the main thing that they did to make yes. the movie, which is why people <laughs> uh, were, uh, were 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 upset. So, um, so so Birth of a Nation. One of the big um, one one of the big things about Birth of a Nation is that it was um, it had uh, white people playing black people in blackface, mm -hmm. and one of the points of Birth of a Nation was to justify what was eventually called the redemption, which was um, uh, white power structures taking voting rights and right and, and civil rights away from black people that they had gotten in the wake of the Civil War. And so what Birth of a Nation did was it convinced white people that black people were lazy and slovenly and sexually violent. There's a scene where a woman, a white woman, throws herself off a cliff rather than be raped by a black person, which is actually a white person in blackface, right? So so, so part of what they were doing was in that movie was trying to justify, present the Ku Klux Klan as heroic figures, but also justify their heroism by pretending that black people were um, these subhuman caricatures who did not deserve to be elected to the legislatures in the way that they were in the wake of the Civil War, did not deserve the right to vote, did not deserve to have equal rights alongside white people. We come to the modern age, and what we're trying to do now in diversity is show, um, uh, is, is show all these parts of the American story that didn't get told when they should have been told when these movies were first made. I mean, Killers of the Flower Moon, I think, is an interesting example because this is a a story that should have been told a long time ago uh, mm -hmm. about uh, how uh, indigenous people were given land that was thought to be worthless. Turns out there's oil there, and then all of a sudden uh, a flood of white people come in and try to figure out ways to swindle or coerce or steal um, that wealth from the indigenous people who own it, and uh, you know, it's forcing America to sort of face the troubling truth about what its wealth is really based on uh, and how indigenous people were actually treated. Uh, it's taken this long to get a movie like that. And when and Martin Scorsese admits it, when he first came up with the idea and first wrote the script, it was centered on white characters. <laughs> and so, you know, it's it's constantly the struggle to get stories told from the perspective that uh, that's outside of white culture that's outside of the white filmmakers who run Hollywood and that tells these stories in a different way so we get a different perspective on what happened. And indeed, you know, one of the big criticisms of Oppenheimer is that we don't see much about the Japanese perspective 
on what happened, even though, um, you know, they are the only country to have been um, officially attacked by nuclear weapons. (laughs) <laughs> so 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 uh um, the so person that you see the skin fall off of there's this this image that oppenheimer has as he's talking to a crowd and you see somebody's yeah. skin really it's a graphic image of somebody's skin falling apart and it's a american white person in the audience not a not somebody yeah. who was obviously impacted by the bomb or something like yeah, that but I that's mean, just to you give know, you one small idea yeah and and you know chris chris nolan had a story he wanted to tell and i don't think he wanted to grapple very much with the perspective of the Japanese or the people who, you know, were actually, um, you know, attacked by these weapons. I, I you know, and it, 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 when you just view it as a, as, a, as a storytelling choice, it makes sense. But it's also continuing this white centering of stories about history that um, is still a problem in Hollywood. But that films like Killer, the Killers of the Flower Moon can't help get around. Now, the, the way you really get around it is that you give an indigenous filmmaker the money and the clout and the agency that Martin Scorsese has, and you let them tell the story. <laughs> and 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 I, I hope at some point we will we will see that. Uh, but until then, you know, uh, we've got Killers of the Flower Moon, which at least he changed uh, to 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 better feature indigenous performers. And culture, and as a result, you know, Lily Gladstone has a landmark uh, nomination. She's favored to win her category, and if she does, um, she'll she'll make all kinds of history, which is wonderful. Very um, eloquent way to to talk about these movies, and still talk about how these films being white centered, and 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 really, you're still having the big names create these movies at the end of the day. So that's the uh, image it's going to portray at the end of the day is whatever the person making it uh, is going to give you is is, is really important. Want to get into dystopia really quickly because we do have to take a break uh, rather soon. Uh, but this movie's not nominated for an Oscar, but it stuck with me. It's called Leave the World Behind, and it was on Netflix because of that image of dystopia. Let's hear a clip from it. We are seeing ongoing cyber attacks across the country. Something is happening, and I don't trust them. Everything I know, I have told you. I don't believe you. I would do anything to protect my family. What you do is your business. You can't see the trailer, but that's Kevin Bacon's voice at the end of it, and Kevin Bacon is like the meme that comes out of that because he's wearing a Dallas Cowboys hat and he's got a shotgun and um, you know he's very uh, he's very ready for the apocalypse to come as it uh, appears to at the end of this film or at least the coming of a second uh, American Civil War which is something that we've seen in other shows that have come out recently and movies so why are we grappling with this on screen guys I'll open it up to either one of you that wants to answer well, uh, you know, I, I do think that there is a lot of concern about tribalism and how um, tribalism in America in particular um, is becoming an increasing problem and how it can be exploited by America's enemies. And, you know, uh, spoiler alert if you haven't seen the movie <laughs> yet, but, but, uh, but the point of Leave the World Behind is that America's enemies have exploited its fear and paranoia and tribalism and use a bunch of different techniques to turn the country against itself. And, um, you know, it's implied that it's a much less powerful country that couldn't defeat America by um, directly attacking us. So it gets us to attack ourselves. And if we look at the kinds of conversations and conflicts that we've had, for example, in the wake of the horrific uh, attack in Gaza from Hamas, uh, and, and then the subsequent response by Israel, um, you can see that there is a lot of truth to those concerns. Um, the, 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 the conflict and, and, and turmoil over the world's reaction to what's happening in Gaza in some ways has turned uh, a, a lot of groups that used to work together in America against each other. And, um, and of course, you know, we've had an increasing problem with political extremism and tribalism in America that has gone, you know, far beyond, you know, that issue anyway. And so, um, again, it's, it's, a, it's about 
taking these very r real fears that we have about where our society is going and figuring out a way to dramatize them in a way that allows people to think through the issue by seeing characters in a heightened situation that dramatizes all of these issues that we're worried about. So it starts out with um, um, this, this family that's renting an Airbnb being suspicious of the owners when they show up and want to take shelter there in part because the owners, maybe because the owners are black. Uh, and Mahershala so we have Ali some, is the, uh, Mahershala and, Ali his, and his is, daughter and, and his daughter. And, and so we have this weird sort of tension of is the white family suspicious of the black owners in part because of their race, or are they just suspicious because these people showed up out of nowhere and they don't really know them. And, and, and then when, when the, the, the crisis deepens and we see the things that are being used to sort of turn America against itself, all this different tribalism starts to come into play, and that is is dramatized by you know eventually these two families decide to work together and they go to Kevin Bacon's character, who's a survivalist kind of guy who lives in the area, who the <laughs> owner of the Airbnb knows to try and get help, and the guy won't help them because he's just looking out for his family and he's been preparing for this his whole life, and now it's here and he's not about to extend himself to help anybody else. So, you know, it's all these it's all these um traumas and concerns that we have about where society is going encapsulated in this very interesting and compelling fictional story, which is kind of at the heart it, of what TV and film does when it when it when it does its work well. It's horror, it's dramatization, but it's not too far off from where we are because as we've seen since the 2016 election, we've had a lot of influence, uh, as you talk about, from from uh, from foreign figures, or I would say at least uh, uh, international figures. And uh, man, uh, it, it's been easy for people to try and exploit Americans. So we're seeing that play out on the screen. Last question before we go to break to Jeffrey. I've seen some really shocking events unfold in our reality. As we just mentioned, the 2016 election uh, and, and the events surrounding it were pretty big. Uh, COVID-19 pandemic, uh, the mass shootings, uh, COVID-19, uh, January 6th. It sometimes feels like we are living in a horror show. So why are we drawn to post-apocalyptic movies, horror stories, given that context? Yeah, well, I think for a lot of the reasons that Eric suggested, that there is this long history in American storytelling of imagining collapse, collapse of social institutions, collapse of civic institutions, collapse of cultural um, relationships. And in part, it's we try that stuff out in our storytelling as a way to kind of rehearse, both to confess our fears um, about collapse and about, um, you know, that, that our lives are less in our control and less secure than we might otherwise imagine. So we both confess our fears, but they're also, in, I think these stories are kind of rehearsals in which we try to tell ourselves stories about how we might behave when this reality does occur or if it does occur. And so the types of stories of heroism and villainy, it seems to me, that are contained within these stories um, are attempts to kind of rehearse how we might behave. And so I'm, I'm drawn back to the early days of the COVID-19 pandemic in which you had everybody staying home, everybody being very orderly, everybody, for the most part, um, getting along with one another and being very kind to one another. And what's interesting to me about that is that that sort of response strikes me as pretty much the exact opposite of most of the ways in which humans tend to behave in these post-apocalyptic landscapes in our stories. And so, you know, these stories can also sometimes be cautionary tales, right? And rehearsals for maybe how we, we shouldn't behave if we find ourselves in such a situation. Jeff, I want to keep talking about this a little bit at the top of next segment. This is The Wheelhouse. Thank you guys for listening. 888-720-9677 if you want to call in and talk to our guests about politics and Tinseltown. You're listening to The Wheelhouse on Connecticut Public. This is The Wheelhouse from Connecticut Public Radio. 
I'm Frankie Graziano. We're talking about Hollywood, TV, movies, and how politics weaves through it all. I'm joined by guests Eric Deggins, TV critic and media analyst for NPR, and Jeffrey Dudas, political science professor at University of Connecticut. It's just been a great conversation so far that I'm lucky uh, the, to be a part of. 888-720-9677, the number to call if you want to talk to us. Eric, I want to start out by mentioning moments when celebrities get political. Uh, big news, you just brought up Gaza earlier in the last segment, but Melissa Barrera was dropped from Screen 7 uh, following a number of social media posts where she referred to what was happening in Gaza as genocide and ethnic cleansing. While it seems like the actual art coming out of Hollywood can kind of explore and push boundaries, what about the performers themselves? Can they air their opinions? Um, I think it all depends on how you do it. And I think it all depends on um, how stable and strong you are in the industry um, and, and what your fan base expects of you as well. I mean, it's a, it's a complex calculation sometimes. Um, I, I do think that what's going on in Gaza is so um, intense, so longstanding, so rooted in history so brutal um, that I think most celebrities would be smarter uh, to 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 be careful about what they say publicly just because it is such a complex issue and most Americans just don't even really know enough about the history of the conflict to even speak um, um, intelligently about what's happening there. Um, it, it's, it's like watching two neighbors in a blood feud and then trying to insert yourself in it. Um, I, I think, um, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm not familiar with the substance of what um, this celebrity in particular that you cited said, but there have been several celebrities who have spoken out in various ways about things that they felt were going on over there. And some of them... And facing uh, immense have, pressure, too, and politicians facing immense pressure, too, as well. Well, but polit it means politicians' job to sort of ar articulate what America's stance is over there, to to pass bills that may send aid over there, to pressure uh, the people in the the institutions involved in the conflict, both Israel and Hamas, uh, to to uh, to change how they're acting or come to some ceasefire or whatever. So it makes sense that you would pressure politicians. Um, celebrities, on the other hand. Um, you know, we live in this oversaturated media age where celebrity is one of the few things that can kind of cut through the noise. So there's always a lot of pressure for celebrities to get involved in bringing attention to issues or drawing public attention to issues. But even when celebrities are not necessarily uh, remotely near the most qualified people to be talking mm -hmm. about it. And I, and I think I think what most celebrities could could do to help the situation right now is use their celebrity to shine a light on people who actually know what's going on over there and who 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 have really um, you know cogent and incisive um, insights about how to handle what's going on over there rather than they themselves trying to insert um, you know their opinions or whatever as limited as they as as many of them are. Uh, to 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 what's going on, and that's that's always uh, I think the tightrope that a lot of celebrities have to walk is that you know um, I've seen a lot of celebrities choose to try and use their celebrity to shine a light on the experts who actually know what's going on. Unfortunately, we live in an, in a in a media environment where expertise is less and less valued, and the ability to draw attention is more and more valued. And so you have situations where people are speaking out when maybe it would have been better for them to hand the spotlight to somebody else. So, um, you know, and, and I think Hollywood is still trying to figure out how it feels about these things because, um, you know, it, there was a time when Hollywood was very reflexively pro-Israel and would support um, that country and its government and its military and whatever it did. But now there are people who are asking really pointed questions, um, Jewish people and non-Jewish people, about what that government has done and pushing uh, institutions like Hollywood to not be so reflexively uh, supportive. Uh, and, and I think that's also a good conversation to have too. 
And 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 when we talk about giving agency to people who've previously been marginalized, of course, Jewish people have faced a lot of anti-Semitism, but also people from the Middle East and Muslims and people of Arab descent have also been marginalized in America. They feel like they have a stronger voice. Um, they made their voice known, for example, in the Michigan primary. And now, um, you know, they want their concerns about how the Palestinian people, the civilians there are being treated. They want their concerns addressed, too. And so we're in a situation where there's a lot of conflicting ideas and our reflexive response is, is not is obviously not not adequate. And, and people are pressuring Hollywood to be to pr produce a more nuanced response in the same way that they're pressuring the American government to produce some more nuance for response and and it's an ugly process but it's a conversation that we need that we need to have and jeff and I, I only have about 30 seconds to do this part of it probably should take some time maybe to to try to get that nuance on screen as we saw with maybe an event like 9 11. sure yeah i mean eric and i are in heated agreement uh on <laughs> this and um you know the only thing that i would add is that i i think that <laughs> I always wonder why it is that we expect our celebrities to offer their hot takes and their opinions on things that, as Eric says, they most of them are manifestly unaware of um, or incompetent to speak intelligently about. And uh, it, it strikes me that we should ask ourselves why we find it so important to hear from these folks. And we should also, I think, appreciate that we also live in a time in which opinions can be generated very, very quickly and without a lot of caution and without a lot of thought put into it. And so there's a way in which the increasing social mediaization of American society um, actually short circuits some of the safeguards that um, you know publicists try to put in place um, around their, their clients. And so part of what's happening is that you've got this kind of breakdown in conventional modes of communication um, coming out of Hollywood as well. So we're having a conversation about race in this uh, show. We had one uh, before we came on, uh, the, the three of us. And uh, I understand that Eric Deggins tried to have a conversation about race. <laughs> with. Uh, I, this is the last question of the segment. I want to make sure that we talk about this before I let you go. Or at least uh, we're going to have you on in the next, seg next segment. But before we end this segment, i got to ask the, uh, the TV goat about this. Uh, tell me about The Bachelor and, uh, and, and what producers are trying to, to do about race and uh, some of the way that we talk about this in Hollywood. Yeah, well, anybody who's fans of The Bachelor or who has watched coverage of the show knows that um, they, they have stumbled into race-based controversies, particularly when they have black people who star as the person who picks among all of the contestants to find their true love. Uh, particularly when they had a black man as a star of The Bachelor for the first time, Matt James, about three years ago. Um, they had real problems with race. Um, it, and it wound up, uh, the longtime host, Chris Harrison, wound up leaving the show over it. And so um, I had a chance. These, these executive producers rarely speak publicly about what happens on their shows. And so they, the three producers from The Bachelor were at a press conference in Los Angeles with several other reality TV producers. And so I just asked them, why does The Bachelor have such a hard time grappling with race issues, when, particularly when black people are the stars of the show? And I, I mentioned that Chris Harrison left the show. I mentioned that the first black ba bachelorette the first black woman to be the star of Michelle. that show, um, uh, uh, R Rachel uh, Lindsay. Oh, Rachel has, Lindsay as well. Uh, yes, she 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 uh, she terminated her involvement with the show. She has criticized how the show talks about race, and so I just asked them, you know, what's going on here? Why is this such a problem? And the only producer who would try to answer was a producer who didn't work on the show when those uh, when those episodes when that when that stuff happened. And I said, look, you know, I understand what you're trying to do now. But what I'm asking you about is what happened before. Why was it such a problem? Why did Chris Harrison wind up having to leave? And what did you have to change if you changed anything to make the show handle these issues better? And there was silence for eight seconds. <laughs> and, and, and what it dramatized was what I've always been saying about the show, which is that these producers so resist acknowledging how white-centered The Bachelor is. They are not prepared 
when race-based controversies come up. And, uh, and, 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 and they, they are constantly stumbling into them, when, particularly when a black person is the star of the show, it's much more likely that race-based controversies are going to happen in a way that the show cannot ignore them. And, and they're constantly stum stumbling into these issues because they, they refuse to face the central truth, which is that The Bachelor presents this very upper middle class, white centered vision of what romance is. And, um, and, and, in, and in, in many ways that makes it tougher for the people of color who choose to um, participate in the show. In a situation never, where the people never, that are appearing on the show don't even have a lot of power compared to the, uh, the well, the you know, that's and the most character. of these shows, on most of these shows, they don't. But the, but the thing is what people of color have constantly told me who've been on reality competition shows, survivor, big brother, and the bachelor is that it, it's already tough to be on these shows, but then the racial dynamics if they're if the show doesn't grapple with how much harder it is for people of color to be on the show then you have an extra layer of difficulty that is rooted in prejudice and stereotypes and and, and all this uh, stuff and 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 so and and most shows try to ignore it uh because most of their compa most of their participants are white and so they don't feel like they really have to address it because uh, the people that it affects on the show are a small portion of the people who participate in it. But but to have a reality show that is constantly placing an unfair burden on the people of color who choose to participate in it, that that's a terrible thing. And and so part of dealing with it is forcing them to talk about it publicly. Yeah. And 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 they and they really have have resisted that. And 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 that eight seconds of silence just dramatized so much. And, um, you know, I've had people tell me, you know, this was part of a 10-day a um, series of press conferences with TV critics um, done by uh, TV providers from all over the spectrum, everybody from Apple TV to ABC to NBC. And, and, and I had people tell me that was the most affecting moment of, of the entire press tour wow. because it, it, it really encapsulated all the problems that they have with talking about race publicly and how it unfolds on the show. And, 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 you know, I, I look forward to, I, I've been trying to have discussions with people connected to the show. I want to have a fair, realistic, I'm not asking a gotcha question. I really wanted to know what they thought. And it was disappointing to me that either they weren't willing to share what they thought or they hadn't thought about it deeply enough or weren't prepared for that question because it just seems kind of insane to me that you wouldn't be prepared to answer uh, questions about an issue that led to your host, your longtime host and executive producer, resigning. Well, we appreciate so, you asking that question, and we appreciate having the conversation on here, at least, even though they won't do that out in L.A. Thank you for, for bringing it <laughs> sure. to us. Sure. And uh, Jeffrey Dudas is going to leave us as we go to the next segment. Jeff, thank you so much for coming on. We appreciate it very much. I enjoyed being here again, Frankie. Thank you. We got about five minutes of the show left after this break. You're listening to The Wheelhouse on Connecticut Public. This is The Wheelhouse from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Frankie Graziano. If you want an outsider who doesn't like politics as usual or pronouncing the G at the end of the word she's saying, I think you know who to vote for. I think if there's one thing we learned tonight, it's that America needs a walk. Woman as president. Strategery. Vice President Gore. Lockbox. This man is clearly unfit to be commander in chief. Oh. He is a bully. <laughs> Shut up. He started the birther movement. You did. He says climate change is a hoax invented by China. It's pronounced China. Oh, and for those Joe Six Packs out there playing a drinking game at home, Maverick. That is a montage of past SNL debate sketches. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. 
Uh, great stuff there. Saturday Night Live, uh, essentially already back, Eric Deggins. NPR media, course, excuse me, media analyst and TV critic, uh, already back talking about politics and 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 ready to go, huh, Eric? I mean, I, I guess um, I, you know, um, I'm a longtime fan of the show. I've written a lot of stories about it. Visited the show twice, uh, and and I have to say, I've been uh, particularly disappointed in um, this season how they've discussed politics and uh, the sketches that they've come up with uh, because they don't really seem to have much to say that's original or incisive about this moment. And it is, um, it is, it, it is deeply disappointing. And I, and I think um, it's sort of summed up in the fact that they have not even found an actor who can really do uh, an incisive um, 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 impression of of President Joe Biden, mm-hmm. and and I and I think that's one of the things um, that's interesting about SNL is that once they figure out how to lampoon a president, they also kind of figure out how to lampoon the times that that president is in power. So 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 when they you know it's it started all the way back when Chevy Chase would do an impression of uh, President Ford and. And and you know portray him as this sort of stumble bum who would trip over things. He didn't look anything like President Ford. He didn't sound anything like him. But he managed to find an aspect of Ford that people found funny and blow that up into a characterization of his entire presidency. And even though uh, Gerald Ford was an athlete and was considered somebody who was actually physically gifted, uh, he stumbled once coming out of a plane. And that became the joke about him, and he was never able, really, to to uh, he he always had to contend with that. So, um, and 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 I think we, you know, even you know, you you know, um, Saturday Night Live got most incisive about the Trump presidency when they found somebody who could really um, nail an incisive and telling impression of him, both Alec Baldwin. And um, and the new guy that they have on now, whose uh, whose name is escaping me, but but he does a, a really great Trump that that really nails James all the Austin Johnson, I believe him. his name is. Yeah, right, right. So so maybe so, Saturday so now Night Live they struggle. They struggle. But... Well, let me finish the thought. Yeah. So they struggle to come up with a Biden that encapsulates what is funny or absurd or 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 somehow um, you know hypocritical uh, about that figure. And so they, I don't think they've been able to come up with a way to lampoon. Biden's presidency or the things that are happening during it. And it's really uh, hurt the show's ability to come up with great what cold opens, you know, the open the, the sketch that opens the show. Uh, and, and it's really hurt their ability to, to um, uh, be influential in the conversation in the way that they like to be. We've had such a great show that we only actually have about 30 seconds left. So just help me understand. They might not get it from Saturday Night Live, but maybe... Viewers can get it from the Daily Show. This kind of uh, this political uh, discourse. Uh, do you think that can happen there with John Stewart back? Uh, absolutely, and I think John Stewart returned to the show. You know, he had he had left in 2015, essentially sort of retired from hosting the Daily Show anyway, and came back when the Daily Show wasn't able to replace the host who replaced uh, John Stewart, Trevor <laughs> Noah. Uh, they spent a year trying to find somebody. They really couldn't. So they cut a deal where um, John Stewart is hosting every Monday. And then a correspondent on the show hosts the rest of the week. This week is Ronnie Chang. And I think he's sort of proven. He came back in uh, a few weeks ago. Um, and, and really, it was as if he had only been gone a couple of weeks. He he, seemed he's already getting out there. He seemed to really just pick up where he left off. He started with a subject that de- that was Eric, thank you so uh, much. That, for- that divides both sides. It was a, really a great performance. Thank you so much for coming on the show, particularly during this busy week. Today's show produced by Chloe Wynn, edited by Meg Dalton, and our technical producer is Kat Pastor. Thank you for Lily Tyson to helping us in studio today. Download The Wheelhouse anytime on your favorite podcast app.